Kansas anymore. Oh, Mr. Carpenter, I wonder where you were. Oh, Mr. Carpenter, I have a big job for you. John, who was John? And I want you to send the carpenter. A carpenter. Ah, never mind. Oh, Mr. Carpenter, I wonder where you were. Oh, Mr. Carpenter, I have a big job for you. Hello and welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair. We are back and I'm over the moon because I'm here with a good friend, John Carpenter, who is known as the movie man. Uh, John has made it his uh, voyage in life to introduce silent films to errors, uh, you know, people and he's amazing at, at what he does and his knowledge. John Carpenter, welcome to my lair. Hey, Gail, it is so good to hear you again. It's great and an honor to be on your phone, dear, your show, dear. Um, so, you're, you're called the movie man. Why? Yes, I'm, <laughs> well, really, and it's a very true moniker, as they call it. Uh, it's, it's a name that was given to me by a New York newspaper, and they were always writing about the fact that I'm one of the, I'm, if not really one of the, the only fellow there who is g- busting my head to make sure the films of the past are made available again. You know, these films are not just entertainment, and really the thing to call them old films, I was writing a, an article, a, a, a monthly article for a magazine called Active Lifestyles, and the very first two-page article I wrote for them under my, <laughs> my the our name of the uh, the column I had was called The Man, and my opening comment was that I don't feel old fi- films of the past should be referred to as old films. That is, unless you've seen them four or five times, then they're old. But when you watch a film of the past, it's just like watching a film made today. It's brand new, it is exciting, but with the films of the past, the people behind cameras and in front of the cameras, they, it's so obvious how they did it, dedicated their entire lives and ambitions to the more their work. They ate, slept, dreamt, they, 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 that was it. They were their work, and that's why all of the stars in films of the past are so iconic and really should be seen again. Because when I do show them again, I mean, I have been the film historian of the East Meadow Public Library in Long Island, New York, for over 14 years now. And for each month, I have a new screening of films that I will and show in a neighborhood movie house fashion, meaning a similarly themed short that goes with a similarly themed feature. And... This is why I'm called the movie man, because I have devoted my entire life to films, to movies, and keeping them alive. They are, you know, it really is like, I know I'm, I'm talking a mile a minute, but I get so hopped up on this, Gail. And it's so important that I am in some sort of an archea- of a Indiana Jones of filmic archaeology. And that is to find these films dig them out, preserve them, and then show them. And historically, they're important because they illustrate what was going on at the time of these films' first release in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They are um, pictures. You know, I call, I call uh, my, I take little snapshots, and they're, Mm -hmm. they're, they're moments in time. And they, they tell people, you know what? What was going on at that time, that moment? Um, even when, um, and and I'll go back to Buster Keaton with the general. You know, it was he did a war. You have to remember there were people alive at that time right. that remembered, yeah, remembered the Civil War, and even though he made it into a comedy and stuff, um, you watch it and it's kind of a historical archive. 
Right. It's like an H.G. Wells time machine. Mm -hmm. What films are, and you mentioned The General, which was 1925. That is an absolute time machine. In fact, Gail, I want all your audience to know, out of all the films Keaton made, The General, which is now heralded as his ultimate classic, The General in 1925 was a flop financially. Mm -hmm. be because it wasn't the typical uh, Keaton slapstick, well thought out comedy. Yeah, uh, yeah, they didn't, um, they didn't want to be reminded, I think. Well, yes, but they were used to seeing Keaton in a certain light. And this was more, I mean, the fact that he, well, Keaton had a thing frame. And throughout all of his shorts and his features, there's always something going on with trains. And this, was, this is what he made the film all about, which really, the general was taken from an actual live, living fiction that happened in the Civil War days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was more than it was, a, re it was a, a recollection that people didn't want to see. It was just not Keaton, because the film was so strong in story and a recreation of what happened in the war. It wasn't what the audiences wanted to just, you know, it, was mm -hmm. escape it wasn't escapism. Which no. Keaton was really, because Keaton was a very surrealistic comedian. Mm hmm yeah. Um, you got an award recently. Um, can you tell us about it? Oh, I am so honored to tell you, you about this and tell the audience about this. Uh, the New York Veteran Police Association. Now, there's so much, so many downplaying of the New York police, and but this really proves that they are not, they really are for the communities and the people. Now, they have known that I have been doing uh, the shows at the East Center Public Library for so long, but they have been noticing and they've been sending their <laughs> spies to come out and check my shows out and check the charismatic way that I do introduce the films and lecture about them prior to showing them. But they notice, which has been my main goal, is that to utilize films of the past to bond people together. At the East Minnesota Public Library, I have people coming in from all different communities. Nassau County, Suffolk County, that's the north and east of Long Island. I have people coming in from Queens. I mean, the show, my shows are always packed. And this is not just bragging. This is showing the power of unifying communities. I was given an award by the New York Veteran Police Association, President Lou Talano, and the Vice President, Richard Ornstein, and if I can make a little sidetrack on this, Richard Ornstein, he was, well, my dear friend Joe Franklin, uh, he was Joe Franklin's uh, second banana on his WOR radio show. So that's why Joe Richie knew about me, and he turned the entire Veteran Police Association on how I was connecting people, no matter their age, their race, their religion, their sexual affiliation. Uh, it didn't matter because I moved to the public. And mm -hmm. that's why they were so always welcome to come. All types of people, all people, because we, we are one people. We're all human beings with the same species. And what I laugh at, you laugh at, and in the darkness of a theater, we all become one, experiencing the same emotions in the presence of the person sitting right beside you. Yes, yeah, so they gave you an award, and uh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> they get an award, and then they kicked me out of town. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I know. All right. And when are you moving out of my place? No, okay, no, 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 keep going. You're cooking, you, Gail, your cooking <laughs> is way too good. Now, do you expect me to leave? I mean, I'm not that stupid. I may look that <laughs> stupid, but I'm not. No. <laughs> um, they gave me this award, and uh, they had a big meeting. I met the mayor of Freeport, Long Island. 
Uh, I've been involved with all these things, and they want me to join forces with them and spread the word. I have also been uh, for a goy. I'm a Catholic boy. I have been. I have been had the absolute tremendous honor. This is what I'm trying to show people too. It isn't just me. It's with the fact that films. You know, there's a girl on Facebook by the name of Shishka Ravelli. She runs the Warren Heimer Fan Club. He was a, a thug uh, comedian in the 30s. And uh, she said this best, and I'm going to quote her, of which you'll probably sue me if so I say it for using her quote. Um, Films are love. And that's what it is. And, they, you know, I have now been going, and this is the absolute thrill, going temples, because just past was the... Uh, I can't really say a celebration, but a special a dedication, um, as well in the Catholic faith, you'd say masses, <laughs> but uh, I don't think you'd say that in the Judaic faith, but go, I would be going to temples and proving, having films of the Three Stooges where they imitate and parody Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo, and they prove, again, this is like you saying, Gail, this is like a time machine. Uh, this I've been getting awards for. In fact, they want to even put me up for an, um, an award as a Gentile, who um, I'm a gentle Gentile, uh, who mm-hmm. um, is a very, very, my heart is really out for the Holocaust victims. And that's what I've been doing and preaching and teaching. And because this, these films, three diminutive Jewish lowbrow comedians, the Three Stooges as everyone regarded them, they really were political satirists. Mm-hmm. This, again, this is again showing the time machine aspect of an HL kind of feel that these films hold because they prove that America did know there were things as concentration camps, there were these atrocities going on, and this supposed master race was really looking to destroy the world. And yeah. These films prove it. But the thing is, no other studio was releasing these films. And the, I first got the idea to make this compilation and this program because I came across an article titled, Why Hitler Hated the Three Stooges. Now, of course, that caught my attention. I said, <laughs> with anybody. <laughs> but the thing was that I gathered up and compiled all these films where Hitler is played by Mo, Curly is played, uh, Mussolini is played by Curly, and the Tojo is played by Larry, but how they absolutely, pr- I mean, this is not slap low comedy. The three students, they really have to be looked at because my audiences, they beg me to show three students comedies. Because really, these films were incredibly thought out and planned. But yeah. these films, uh, the temples are going crazy because this proves that all of this was known. Because these films were made and begun being made in 1938. And that was way before World War II. Yes, hello, Gail? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Um, yeah, the movie was You Nazi Spy. And oh, it yeah, came yeah. out... It came out in 1940, and um, in it, I loved the opening uh, introduction to the movie, and I'm going to try to bring it out uh, because I want to read it exactly. It says, any resemblance between the characters in this picture and any persons living or dead is a miracle. Uh, and it was 1940, the Three Stooges. Why I like them better than the Marx Brothers. I mean, I'm not saying the Marx Brothers weren't good. I'm just saying I relate it better to the Three Stooges is because they always either went after the bad guy or each other. Uh, very rarely did innocent bypassers get, get creamed, you know? And that was their thing. They represented the every man, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and a regular guy. I mean, in reality, you really couldn't find a Groucho, or definitely not a Harpo or a Chico. But um, the Stooges were really every man, and I think people.
people could, well, as proof as at my shows, because what I do at my film programs is that I theme these similar, it has to be a similarly themed short to a similarly themed feature, because in my experience, I have found that if I show a short that isn't thematically hooked with feature, my audience, they kind of take a while to then get a, get Warmed up. What, well, it, it, this way it's a, it's a single, fl- it's a similar flow. It's a steady stream of, of plot. Like, for right. instance, if I put a railroad comedy before a, a, um, a spaceship comedy, that's kind of disjointing. But now, the reason why I began using the three sisters, because they made so many hundreds of films, they made so many hundreds of different plots and themes that they're so easy to find a feature that has the same theme as their short. And if I may add, uh, You Nazi Spy, which was uh, the Three Stooges, as you mentioned, that film, as Mo Howard has always said, out of all of the thousands of films they made, Mo was most proud of You Nazi Spy. Yeah, they really, um, they really took a swing at at, at the whole Third Reich, uh, you know, and and um, the writers of it uh, were amazing, uh, and and. Well, listen, J- J- Gail. The yeah. Ri- one of the writers, Clyde Bruckman, used to work for Buster Keaton in the silence. A lot of the staff that worked at Columbia were all from the silent days. Right. And that that genius and that experience and that professionalism of comedy and the creation of comedy was all there. Now, Columbia was a low-budget poverty studio at the time, so they were really taking people, comedians who had names, but they really weren't, they were, they were getting older. Now, the Stooges began their career with Ted Healy. In fact, Bill Cassera has written a fantastic book on Ted Healy. Ted Healy is, was a very important comedy icon at the time. And he's another one who should be remembered. He was the original guy. He was what they called the reactionary comedian. And as a reactionary comedian, he needed stooges to be his foils. Right. He would react. He would react to their stupidity. And he would be the mole kind of a role and smack the heck out of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we want to get back to what you do. It, 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 these movies, like we say, they're, they're, they're clips in time. And, and they're so important. You do, you once a week have a, um, a viewing at the East Meadow Library. Once a month. Once a month. Once a month. Okay, East, East Meadow uh, Library in Long Island, New York. Uh, the number there is 516-794-2570. Yes. And, um... Extension 218. Yeah. That, that's a promotion. Department. Yeah, and, um, you guys, uh, you, you have people that come and you see the movies. And, um, well, you're... Yeah, yeah, I make it a family experience because... You know, these people, they're normally ostracized due to the fact that they love old, uh, I almost said old films. Yes, you did. Classic films. Yeah, classic films. You know, and the thing is, but when you all come together in a setting, everyone speaks same language, the language of movies. Mm -hmm. You know, and they all love it, and they become one, and the entertainment and the education that I've... You know, I'm really like the uh, the conduit, the glue between the information of the film and then the film. Because with my information that I'm, in, in essence, teaching these people what is the art of these films. It's not just entertainment. These films were art. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. They, they were. Uh, it, it was. It was a new industry. They were working very hard. Uh, the new uh, ground was being made every day that they worked. Uh, you went from the Black Mariah that Edison had out to California, uh, and then it became a huge industry. 
Well, let me ask you something, because you, you also were an actor. You made a short called Late to Lunch, um, which is adorable. Uh, let, me, let me ask, what movie did it for you that said, you know what, um, I, I, I could talk about this forever? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I have been loving old films since I, against my grandmother's want, I turned on her television and I came across what I later found out was a Charlie Chaplin, Max Senna Keystone. But I was so intrigued by this new sort of a film that I, I was a kid, I was a little kid, and I didn't know, but it was the film I later found out was Gentleman of Nerve, and it had kind of close-ups of Chaplin and Mabel Norman, and it was made in 1914, so it had to be on one of the PBS stations. Right. I was so thrown by this new sort of a film. It was frenetic, it was fast-paced, it was just music, it was very violent, but I just got attracted to it. And I, so my father really embellished upon all that, that lust I had and passion for film, and he kept it going and introduced me more and started uh, buying me films that I could show in my living room on my little Super 8 projector. <laughs> now I've got a, a, a Bolex huge 16 millimeter projector that's like, I don't even think a nuclear holocaust could destroy. And I have over 400,000 16 millimeter films on reels. And, uh, but the first film that really did it for me. My father me to, at around nine years old, ten years old, he took me to a double feature when they still had double features of Breakfast at Tiffany's, which I could not, I, I, could, I don't remember whatsoever at that age. But with it was a silent comedy documentary called Four Clowns. And in that, there was this one comedian who I had never heard of ever in my life or knew of, his name was Charlie Chase. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Chase, what got me about Chase was that he was a regular, handsome man of his period, the 1920s, who, who would get into situations like a regular, handsome man of the time would. Normally, he was involving women and wives and things like that. He didn't rely on odd um, costumes. Uh, makeup was a regular, handsome man, and you could associate with him for the fact that he was a regular human being and not a surreal um, clown, you know? Right. But the first, the first film that really got me was a, a short he made called Limousine Love when he's trying to get to his wedding and he's driving a lim his limousine there and this girl who had a car accident and fell into a mud puddle uh, uses the back seat of his limousine while he's out getting gas to fill it up with. And she uh, disrobes and is naked in the back seat of his limousine. And he has to now figure out a way throughout the, the short of how not to let his wife know that he's got a naked woman in the back seat of his limousine when he's getting married. Right. <laughs> um, it, it, I want to say uh, talk about the methodology of um, film uh, and how much it has changed. We laugh at at that stuff because it left us to our own devices to think they didn't speak, so we had to in our heads speak for them, you know, and, and you went by the way they looked, a, a, a look, or, um, you know, the way they look into a camera, like, what the, you know, now, movies have left us nothing to think, uh, right. we watch it, they spoon feed everything to you, the, the, every ounce of comedy, every ounce of drama, it's spoon fed to you, and, um, I find it disconcerting because it, it's almost like brainwashing now. Um, and the well, other thing, they, they're, when you see, it, see Buster Keaton standing and the building comes down and he's standing and the doorway hits him, that wasn't special effects. That was a real gag. That was a real... It actually happened. He actually did it. There were no special effects. It was worked out... Um, 
was worked out perfectly, you know? Yeah, I don't know who they worked it out with because there's somebody that's got brain damage from the times it didn't work. But by the time he got to it, it worked. Uh, and, and now you st- everything is special effects and it's, oh my God. But yeah. the old movies, they were, you know, okay, he might not have been 14 uh, stories in the air, but he's hanging on a clock. The, yeah. the comedian is hanging on a clock, and he's hanging and looking down like, hey, even if I fall 14 feet, that's going to hurt, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's that in there. Um, emotions. Uh, the other part is you look at Lillian Gish. You look at all of these great, and you know she's been molested. You know she's been beat up. You know she's been hurt. You can tell from her behavior, from the look on her face, you do not have to see the sex act itself. Right. Now, now we can't watch a movie that we're not seeing a sex act. You know, and the thing is, it's more powerful if your mind thinks yeah. about these things and figure out, figures out what's going on and seeing it. Because your mind is a, has a stronger imagination than any uh, filmmaker's pen. You know, yeah. any director, your mind, if you're just thinking what she went through and what, and what made her Im- so strongly that you could feel just by her eyes and the tears that dropped from her eyelids, you know, that is a stronger, stronger feeling. You know, one thing I wanted to add what you were saying, in the Bible, okay, um, they always saying that there was going to be a universal language. It's right. actually written in the Bible. And people believe for the longest time that that universal language was silent film. Because when, where else in the world but with the silent film could you sit in a theater, let's say a Harvard graduate could sit beside a guy who's right off the boat from Ellis Island doesn't understand the language, can't mm-hmm. even read the intertitles that appear on the screen, but they both understand the film as strongly as exactly as the other one does. Yeah, my my father-in-law, um, Teddy is 20 years older than myself, so my father-in-law was in the movies, and one of the first Betty Boop cartoons came on, uh-huh. and he says, wow, get a load of that, and of course, he got a black guy from the old lady from that, you know, uh, you know, and you're right, you know, uh, that was like, holy smokes, look at her, she's in her underwear, you know, she's in, uh, you know, a corset, well, and she's in stockings. Yeah, and a lot of those cartoons, and I have had programs like I've even known, um, Myron Waldman, who was the last of the living, he's deceased now, but uh, I knew personally, and I'm still friends with his wife, Rosalie Waldman, and their son, Steve Waldman, uh, very close friends. Um, they, they, I had film showings, and um, a lot of, uh, from my film collection, we love the art of the Max Fleischer, Betty Boop, and Popeye cartoons, but yeah. in those days, remember, this is before the decency code was passed in Hollywood. Uh, let's let's stop right there. Explain pre-code to our listeners. <laughs> okay. I know what it is. I know what it is, well, but you explain what it is. Well, you know, you you've heard of having a blank, a code with two pairs of pants. Oh, oh, oh. Look, all the jokes can't be good, Gail. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing was that, uh, well, the the, the the at the time were getting very powerful. And they were going, and they were being allowed by the studios, because remember, the f- movie business is a financial business. Yes. And to keep on bringing in people, especially when it was the Depression, and they were bread right outside of the theater, yet you were, instead of buying a loaf of bread, you were buying to go into the theater. Something had to motivate you to do that. And what pre-code was that... Directors were getting a little out of hand, and uh, reality was being shown very, very clearly, which is a, a right thing, and it wasn't being complained about by the audiences. 
because they all knew that right outside of the theater's doors, these things were actually going on the streets. Women were prostituting themselves. Yep. Yes, and they were being seen on film. I mean, there's films such as um, the Bankhead film, I love, and uh, Midnight Mary uh, was another one. The uh, Informer. Pardon? The Informer was a talkie with Victor McLaughlin, but it opens with him finding his girlfriend. She's trying to pull tricks, and he slaps her because it was the way it was, you know? Look, these women survived somehow. They were mm-hmm. starving. But people, there was drug addiction. There was single motherhood. All of this was seen and known. It existed just like it exists. Day and why people are so appalled and shocked now of films of the 30s and showing these things, I don't understand because you look at any TV. I mean, I mean, at one of my shows, I was showing a Betty Boop cartoon called Bimbo's Initiation, and the mother took her little daughter, who was maybe like 10, by the hand and was drawing her out of the, uh, the venue. Uh, and as she passed me, she said, Oh, I can't let my daughter see this. This is too dark for my child to see. Mm. Yet, when they look at TV or they look at MTV, I mean... Hey, you watch Friends. You watch that show, Friends. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Those guys have screwed each other over and over. I mean, they that's the biggest orgy going on. If nobody... Uh-huh. I mean... Uh, the stupid one wanted to get in the every, all the girls' pants. Yeah. Uh, the girls, the, the one slept with the guy that's the, you know, Jurassic guy. I mean, um, these are friends with benefits. I'm, and, uh-huh. and yet an entire two, three now we're working on maybe four generations of uh, kids. You know, I, I mean, you got a, a five-year-old sitting there while you're watching that. And they're going to grow up and they're going to say, well, I'm friends. He, he goes to bed with this one and he goes to bed with that it's one and he norm. goes to bed with this one. It is the norm. And when people say to me they don't expose their children to this stuff, but they, they watch some of these TV shows, and I'm saying, and what world are you in? Yeah. Well, you know, going back to pre-code for a second, you know, uh, what... Uh, they were getting out of hand. Well, they were getting out of hand not by the viewer's point of view who was paying to see these films, if for entertainment, if for reality, if for titillation. Uh, we, I don't know what the deal was. I'm not that old. But, but, but I'm saying, but Hollywood wanted to, they wanted to form, make a czar that would overlook the films coming out of Hollywood. And Hollywood said, "Uh uh-uh, no, no, Washington is not coming into our domain and taking over. So they hired their own fellow by the name of um, Mr. Hayes, and he was the original Postmaster General, but a very boring guy, and they figured, this guy is so, so boring, he will will be a good representation for us making clean productions. And uh, it's Washington who wanted to do this first. So then by 1930, late 1933, they passed this code. But you see, if you're still looking at films of 33 and 34, a few of these films luckily slipped through. Mm-hmm. And still were in production and they passed through. I mean, there's one, there's a Joan Blondell that I, that I have that I've shown with great success called Smarty, where she even says, boy, if I, if I haven't gotten my man to smack me yet, then I'm doing a bad job as a wife. Right. Now, this is shocking to the modern of today, and I've gotten into a lot of trouble on Facebook, even. Mm-hmm. Joan Blundell fan club people. Because when this film was made, it was seen, it was out there. So what's wrong with knowing it? It, I mean, it was during the I time. 
that a I cop would say, hey, let the, you know, what did you do that he had to slap you? You know, um, it, 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 yeah, I'm not advocating spousal abuse. I'm a victim of it myself. Uh, but um, I'm saying that back then men had a lot more um, leeway. And if their wife did something that they didn't agree with, like hit the whiskey or hit the money that, you know, they were going to go put on the ponies, uh, she could come out the next day with a black eye. Yeah, but in this film, it, she feels it's her role as a temptress to own her husband, getting him up to a, such a fever pitch of jealousy mm-hmm. that he does hit her. And that's what, is what the, the, uh, everyone has complained about me showing in modern day. Right. You know, and you think in modern day with all the other things that are on and just being accepted. I'm, I was shocked, but I was crucified on Facebook. Um, you get used to that. I get crucified on a daily basis. You get, you, you get used to it. Um, all I have to do is say, all right, I know everybody's not happy, but do you think all this carrying on on Facebook and, 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 all the the carrying on and there are protocols in place to do certain things and you can't just keep sitting there saying he's not my president he's not my president he's not okay so he's not your president he might not be my president either but at least i know enough that i'm going to watch what he does and if i can get him on an impeachable offense and that is the thing well when i say that i'm a horrible person it's like we've become children who think if we just scream loud enough in the grocery store, we're going to get what we want. Well, let's spoil. This is being spoiled. Yeah. Because everyone's so, so being spoiled, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, look, this is the situation. We've got it. And look, the majority won. He did get elected legally. So there we, we deal with it. You know what? I, I look at it this way. He's He's like... You know, he's four months through. You know, I count months. It's like a car payment. Hey, baby, we only got three and a half more years to pay this. That's how I look at it. Three and a half more years and we'll be done paying for the car, you know? Uh, let Let me tell you this, Gail. The first time... I ever did a film showing, a film screening. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I did it for Imus and Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? That's funny. A, com- a comedian that I knew named Fran Capo, she was hired by Don Imus to do a roast for his buddy, Donald Trump. And, right. Um, they wa- there was no DVDs. There were no videos, but I had film. You know, the real thing. Mm-hmm. So they, she wanted to begin this roast by my showing very fast, flickery, frenetic, Keystone Cop-ish England films prior to, you know, the, um, the roast. Right. And uh, so I was there doing that, and that was the first time I really showed films in a public venue. And, um, but there, Donald, it, was, it was a roast for Donald Trump, and Don Imus was there, and... I, I, there you go. <laughs> so, in yeah. essence, it's ironic that he becomes president. Maybe he should make me the czar of film in Washington. There you go, the historical <laughs> keeper of film. Uh, yeah. The, what, uh, your era, do you, is there a certain particular era that you, you uh, concentrate on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I do love the silent period. I love it very, very much. Um, because there was artistic essence in the photography as well. There was lighting, and then when sound came in, of course, that all kind of altered, everything got very static. And that era really fascinates me. In fact, what I've done is preserved a few actual, I mean, 1929, 28, actual first talking films that are now being sold by um, Alpha Video that I made, I preserved and I spent a mint, preserving this in a mint, glistening, almost brand new condition uh, when they were almost, they were almost going to warp out of existence. But uh, the early talkie period is very fascinating to me because it, it, it hems that transitional period from silent to sound. You know, but my favorite is the screwball comedies of the 30s. 
Yeah. I love those most, man. Yeah. The characterization, I mean, the plot, the insanity of the plot, the, but, but, it, but it all has to be taken as it'll work out. It'll happen. And in the end, there's a nice ending. But the characters you meet along the way, the scripts were so well written. Because at that time, you must realize that there were so many great character actors who mm-hmm. could play these oddball, kind of strange parts. And let's be real. Life, okay, now let's talk about being politically incorrect, which is something I'm very strong on, and I've done a lot of lecture programs on. Um, being politically incorrect or politically correct, Let's face it, Gail, life isn't politically correct. Yep. Okay? So uh, it's pretty hellish 99% of the time. And Mm -hmm. you have to look at it as just a speed bump that you're getting over. But films of that period, I mean, there are so many films that are being totally taken out of circulation due to the fact that they represented... I mean, nothing is is shown negatively or done in a bad way or untasteful way, but it recreates an era when things that are now considered politically incorrect were illustrated, were shown. I'm speaking in reference first about a film I just finished showing, went over great, called Mississippi with W. Fields and Bing Crosby. Um... Bing Crosby, great big star of Paramount in the 30s, and Fields was a genius in the 30s and did his best comic work, but the film takes place in pre-Civil War days, which means, no, you don't see slaves being beaten, but you do see that there were slaves. So the fact that, look, my whole attitude is this. If you're going to erase from the minds of the people what happened past, these things could very well happen again. Yeah. You know? And they shouldn't be. Uh, one, one of the movies that I love uh, is My Man Godfrey. Yes. And The Unwanted Man, you know? Yes. And, oh, and the Depression. Huh, yeah, The Depression. And, yeah. and uh, people look and, and, and they're saying, are you really an unwanted man? You know, yes, I live okay, at... Gail, no, no. Gail, forgotten. Forgotten man, that was a forgotten man. And he says, yes, he says, where do you live? Where do you live? And he says, oh, well, what the dumps on such and such, you know, and, and that. But now, if you, you compare that to now, we have families living in cars because they've lost their homes, they've lost their jobs. It's, it's there. It's, we keep sweeping it under the, the, the rug like it's not our problem. And But you know what? History is just repeating itself over and over and over. Always does. does. And And we have films. That's why we need films like this. We need films like this to show that. (laughs) Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm having such a big success, showing the world again these World War II parodies that the uh, Three Stooges made. Mm -hmm. Because this is illustrating what was going on and... Even though FDR, until Pearl Harbor, of course, uh, really was forced to go into the war. Because you've got to remember, uh, we had just got over World One, which was referred to as the war to end all wars. You see, being a film historian also means being a historian of history, you know? Mm-hmm. And the two must be combined to really get a full feel an appreciation of the films that were made. So, th- in, at the end of this music, this Depression era musical, Gold Diggers of 1933, uh, you know, uh, Ruby Keeler, Dick Powell, John Bondell, Ginger Rogers, Aileen McMahon, the film is a great film, but then all of a sudden, you hit that last musical number where the film ends with, and it is such a... Dis, it's a disjointing aspect. The film is called Remember My Forgotten Man, which mm-hmm. is all about how the men of America came back from World War I only to be hit with Prohibition and the Depression. Yeah. And how, and how they were all out of work. And in the musical number, you see the bread lines, you see them coming home from more bloodied and disfigured and... 
It is a very hard, cold fact of what you're seeing that was real and mm -hmm. the daily thing in people's lives. Uh, the song, the song has, buddy, you got a dime. Yes, yes. That came from a Broadway show called Americana. Mm -hmm. And that that whole show was about what was going on outside. That Broadway show was really about what was going on outside of the theater doors. In fact, mm -hmm. Ziegfeld, the greatest showman of them all, uh, he really lost his shirt. And he put all the biggest hits out there. Showboat, Porgy and Bess, the Ziegfeld Follies. But when the thing came... It really sunk him also. It sunk everybody. Well, and you know, we're always, and, and I don't want to turn this into a political conversation, no, but please. this country has always been the, the, the one that, because it's a young country, by, by comparison with other countries, we're only not even 300 years old. Right. Do you, so we're like the youngsters. And whenever yeah. the world is in trouble, they send the youngsters to go fight it out. Mm -hmm. The old people don't duke it out. You know, they get the youngsters. And, and we went from the Civil War to, you know, the Spanish War to, mm -hmm. to World War I. Then we went to World War II. And in between this, we had the, the flu that went through and killed yeah. millions and yeah. left millions of orphans. And then you have orphans trains going out to the Midwest, carrying children that have no family. Um, a lot of these movies were made to try to uplift people, but they also kind of felt like somebody had to make sure that this was recorded in time that this was going on. There you are, absolutely. Yeah, you know, you can feel good, you can sit there and drink a beer, but when you look out the window, it's still raining, you know. Um, and a lot of these films uh, were, yes, they were entertainment, yes, they were trying to make money because, and I say this all the time, actors and actresses are commodities. They are not human beings, well, they are commodities. Well, yeah, Gail, what I say to my, to my film club, my film classes, my programs, is that the real star of the movie is not the, not the actors. The real star is the director. Because a real di a director, he leaves his mark film. You, just by seeing the style of the film, you know he is the star. He put his brand on it. So no matter who the cast is, you know, and they're, they're just mainly puppets. Actors are mainly just puppets. Oh, yeah. Without a good director, you've got nothing. You know, and without a good storyline, you've got nothing. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I always sit there and say, I'm not taking pictures, I'm making memories. And, and that's why I think these, these old films are so important. And when we talk about pre-code, yeah, uh, and, and there's a, a little throwback in that um, Hitch, the movie Hitch, where he's doing the thing, uh, filming uh, the, um, the, the shower scene for Psycho, mm -hmm. and his wife looks and says, oh, you got a little bit of, you know, body, you know, whatever part in there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, yeah, you look at these great uh, older actors, Swanson and all them, and you can see through their dresses. You can see through their dresses. And you know what? It, the, the 70s... We didn't invent that. That was way back. You know, Cleopatra came out in, you know, materials so fine you could see her belly button. Yep. You know, so... Yeah, very true. And this, uh, like the makeup girl on the very first film that I made, Late to Lunch, the, and that was a... Uh, oh, boy, did I get hell for that. By all the actual filmmakers that I knew, the big filmmakers in California. Oh, you're making it sound like you're stupid. You'll never get anywhere. Ba, 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 ba. But it really, that's the film that made my name well known and got me really out there, you know? Right. So that film is called Late to Lunch. There are clips of it on YouTube. Uh, but it's also, it was studied, well, I shot it in 1987. I was a wee child. No, <laughs> I shot it in 87, but I still had dark black hair. And, and it, was, it was released to theaters in 2002. Uh, in 2009, 
the DVD Company Alpha Video, www.oldies.com, they uh, contacted me and they really wanted to put it out on DVD, of which it is out on a DVD which has become, and I swear to God on this, it has been a top of the top ten of their selling DVDs since 2009. The name of the DVD it's on is Silent Comedy Classics, and with it are the comedians, silent comedians of the time that influenced my became silent film comedian. There are six really rare Charlie Chases, uh, two Chaplins, and so forth. But uh, the whole thing is that um, you gotta, you gotta just put this stuff out there. People have got to see, people yeah. have got to see the past to appreciate the present and the future. And yeah. what, going, going back to what you were saying, Gail, you know, in the beginning of the conversation, that my groups are all seeing that, because where can you be one with an audience anymore? I mean, you just, you, these people, are, and when I show silent films, which no one does, um, my, my theater, my, my, my East Meadow Public Library auditorium is packed. And I'm not bragging, I'm just saying this is fascinating that these films hold this wallop, this attention pull, because as I was saying with my film, it was such an oddity for someone in 1987 to shoot and then in 2002 to release a recreation of silent comedy, because then in 2012, a day later, when the, film, the silent movie The Artist came out, you see it won all the Academy Awards. Mm-hmm. And freak shows, oh, it's, it's a freak. It, it's something that no one else is doing. And um, this is the interest that it holds. Because when you're watching a silent film, you become one with the image. You are so involved in what's going on with the screen. You right. become one with that. And that's what I love about it. Because, you know, film is man-made, it is a human art form, it is made by someone's hands, their minds, their hearts, and their souls, and it connects with other human beings in the audience. And mm -hmm. that's my way of people I will never personally even know, but I will be touching them, and it's hope they're not ticklish, <laughs> but I will, be t I will be touching them in ways that I've wanted to touch the world. And this is my way to do it because with a silent film, you get so lost and submerged in the action. On the you screen. have to pay attention. Yeah, and there's no such thing um, as, uh, stop it, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And, right, and, that, right. and, and, and that's another thing. That's a distraction. When you sit down and you watch these and you watch them, it, they're not so long that you can't watch it without having to run to the bathroom and, and that kind of thing and so you're getting the full effect now movies are getting longer you have to go to the bathroom and and with the people <laughs> watching them at home you know hey stop the film i gotta go get the kids and we'll watch it the rest later it's it detracts from the film well yeah but, but also you know, people use their cell phones and they're on the phone talking I mean, mm -hmm. because you really don't have to commit yourself to the picture on the screen. Right. It can be jointed. Because everything, like you said originally, is all being discussed and displayed for you and being spoon-fed into you. Yeah. You could just be null and void. You could just be... Uh, it's, it's just an art form. It's a, the film of the picture is an art form. But it's my main goal, Gail, that these films be seen and let people... Pizza, I mean, people have come to the fact, and they've said this to me, that's why at, at my shows I get all races, all ages, all ages, you know, mm -hmm. and when, when grandparents have dragged their, like, 15-year-old kids with them, the mm -hmm. kids actually I make myself always very available to speak after a show with them one-on-one, -on -one, you know? Right. And they come up to me and they say, wow, John. I never knew a black and white movie could be so good. Oh, yeah. And that's an honor, an honor. You know, but, but people know it. And the thing is that these films, even if they don't know what the heck I'm showing, 
because I'm sitting in my basement talking to you, and I have about 100,000 more discs all lined up that I still have to make. I was just going to ask you, how many movies do you have? Oh, on film? Oh, mm -hmm. boy, you want to know everything, don't you? <laughs> just like a woman. No. I just don't want to move next door to you and, and have it go up in flame. <laughs> no, it's not nitrate anymore. Okay. No, all i got to tell you, uh, and all the other things, see, I really am a movie man, and I had that trial by fire, because when I was, when I was younger, uh, I actually came across in the street a 35 millimeter nitrate print of a film which uh, was called Sewing the Line. It was a one reel, 10 minute educational reel on how, what sailors did on their naval cruiser to keep themselves occupied, like 1930, the film was. Um, and the album was a little starting to foam up, but I was a youth, you know? Yeah. And uh, I said, wow, now I'm really a film historian. I've got a nitrate print. No. Oh. Uh, I put that nitrate print in the safest place in the apartment, which was the bathroom, because the walls were all enamel, there was no wood. And I figured, if this ever should blow, there's nothing really to burn. Well, right. I, uh, one morning, uh, my mother was doing uh, washing things in the sink. This is uh, when I was a youth. And she, the phone rang. She went out to answer the phone. And in the time it took for her to answer the phone, begin a conversation, there was a loud pop. Mm -hmm. And it does a film blue, all on its own, set the bathroom on fire, disjointed a wall. <laughs> The house is full of fun. But that was my trial by fire. That I actually had an in a negative run in with a 35 millimeter film, which made me really have the, the guts to say that my lifelong research, history, archaeological finds, preservation, it, it's all, it's all been, it, it's all, I'm, I'm the real deal. Right. Because, because I've gone through the negatives of history and collecting and preserving and research you know and and i speak and let me tell you these people come to my lectures because a lot of times i might not show a film a lecture on a film or something they will they in fact sometimes my lectures are more packed than my uh film presentation like and lectures because i really well they all say oh you know john is the show the film isn't the show <laughs> right. They yeah. Keep the show because I get, I can get pretty, pretty, pretty serious and down on these things. Like when I'm dealing with things like being politically incorrect. I mean, you can't just lock things away that were decades ago. Right. As as affronts to today's people who are supposedly so big and high and mighty and intelligent nowadays, Gail. How can mm -hmm. they old films uh, ab ab abuse us. It's impossible. You know, um, what we're doing, you know, you watch these old films and the, the cracks they made to each other, uh, Wallace Barry, uh, all those old uh, tugboat annies and, and oh, the, yeah. the, 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 the the really uh, un unpredictable stuff that they said, you know, that oh, yeah. today people would go, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. And, and I think and say, what are you going to do when somebody actually looks at you or your kid and says something nasty? Are you going to run home and cry? Uh, you know, I'm not saying we should be vulgar people, no. but we have but to be able... They no, but then. but they were, they were, they were realistic. They were, yes, and they were smart asses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and if somebody said something to you, you went back. I watched the um, Miss Florence. What the heck is that with uh, Merle yeah. Street? Um, uh, oh God, I've got it too. Yeah, she's uh, that old uh, socialite oh, from New York. Jenkins, Jenkins, singer. Florence Jenkins, and um, you know, there's this one girl that's going out with a guy who's like a gangster or something, and and she talks like a truck driver, you know. Hey, what? Hey, the broad is lousy, you know. Oh my God. 
God, she's the worst singer I ever heard in my life, you know. Um, and, and that's real life. Somebody's going to turn around and say, Jesus, Mo sounds like she's underwater, which I always do because I've got COPD. No, I never smoked. Everybody always says, I didn't know you smoked. I never did. How about that? It's nice to have friends who do. And, um, you know, um, what am I going to say? No, I don't. Yes, of course I do. I sound like I sound like Pinocchio underwater. Japan. Oh, la, 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 la. You got to It just makes you unique. You're unique. That's it. And and we have to learn to to accept things like that. And and all we're teaching people is that's not nice. Don't do that anymore. And and I'm afraid we're leaving ourselves wide open to be lambs at the slaughter because we can't take any criticism. And and these old movies remind me there was a time when somebody could walk up to you and say, "Hey, Buster, take it out of here," you know. Well, yeah, but it was still done a different way. It was not the yeah. use of it. I mean, there was, well, anyhow, this is the fact that films, the films of then, they really, the whole, my whole game is that is isn't even a game, it's a goal, it's a purpose, that these films need to be seen. And yeah. the fact is that I see, I'm doing it, and I'm doing it very successfully, have been for uh, more than a decade now, Gail, is because I know what I'm doing, I see speak the truth, and, and I'm not saying anything abusive, and I mm-hmm. always do my lectures very charismatically, very mm-hmm. entertainingly, with very big amounts, like on the videos I put on Facebook, because social media has really eaten me up, you know, which is mm-hmm. great, and, and my uh, group page on Facebook, the Movie Man Movie Matinee, has over 3,000 people. Because I tell it like it is, I joke, but I. But the thing is, I know what I'm talking about. Do you know what? In a, in about uh, I don't know a couple of thousand years, uh, there's going to be a time traveler, and they're going to step into your basement, and it's going to be like the time machine when he swing, he turns the rings, and they tell him the history. That's what your films are going to do. They're, they're going to put your films in and say, oh, my God, no wonder we're at where we are, you know? Uh, and that's great. Um, okay, you have the Movie Man uh, page on Facebook. You have uh, your John Carpenter page on Facebook. I hope, I hope so, because I am wearing his clothes. I hope so. I, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I'm going to get in contact with him and, and get some money. I'll report you. Uh the, uh, the movies are once a month at the East Meadow Library, Long Island, New York. The and number I is... Encourage them, I, you know, I'm sorry, I do encourage people to call because they like to hear people who really are into old films who are heralding the fact that I am doing a for, for people who love films. Mm-hmm. I would love to get out there and see it, but you know my circumstances. Y- yeah. Action. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but could you give the number? Could you give the number? Five one six seven nine four two five seven zero. And again, it's the East Meadow Library, Long Island, New York. Five one six seven nine four two five seven zero. And uh, John has the Movie Man's Matinee Facebook, and he also has John Carpenter Facebook. And um, Okay, I'm going to put you on one more spot, and then we're going to close. Who is your favorite um, silent screen actor? Oh, Charlie Chase, without even a thought. Because, as I was saying, he, he was the first who didn't rely on an odd makeup. He did not rely on odd costume or characterization. He was, a re- he was reality-based. And right. so many could associate with him. But not only that, he wrote, directed, and starred in his films. Sort of like me. <laughs> but yeah. he does, he did all those, those many, many tasks. He was a very well-looked-upon uh, artist, comedian of the time. Uh, he worked for Hal Roach. He worked really everywhere. But mainly he made his name at Hal Roach. Um, but... How was he? How was for something else too? Because Senate, the Senate comedy, the Keystone comedies, um, 
they were really dealing with the surreal, the frenetic, things that really, really couldn't exist or be actually happening in a reality world. Whereas Roach was dealing with the world, interjecting these characters into a modern American reality and seeing how they could get by. Mm-hmm. And who's your favorite actress? Actress Gail Kubik. No, <laughs> I'm not an actress. I'm a, I'm a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker, but I'm not an actress. <laughs> oh, baby, what kind of trouble? <laughs> okay. hey, do we want to go back to how I this this conversation started before we started recording? John thought I was somebody else, and and I, I and I says, "Are you ready?" And he says. Well, for what? What do you want to do? Yeah, <laughs> Gail, Gail, I am single, so you never know. I'm well, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Not yet. <laughs> Anyhow, but the whole thing is, now, through Alpha Video, that's www.oldies.com, I have released and produced over, uh, over like 12 DVDs for them from film prints from my collection. Because I also believe, being a film collector and DVD collector myself, that really you, you want to buy films that are crystal clear and beautiful. And that's why right. these rarities that I do compile and then produce them to DVD for them to sell internationally on DVD, I really demand as I would want them to be. I want them to be as clean and as clear and as complete as possible. And I really loves that. They have my own brand. And they could check that out by going to the Alpha website, www.oldies.com, and put in my name, John K. Carpenter. So it isn't part of his filmmaker, John Carpenter. But mm-hmm. John K. Carpenter, and then in parentheses, The Movie Man, and you see a bunch of the films that I've released to them. But my film prints, and they're, they're, they're compilations the film collectors should know that have never been compiled in any format before, which is, as a collector myself, that's why I am putting these things out that I have on film, but putting them out on DVD for the regular average guy and girl out there have in their collection. No one's ever put these things out before. Right. Which is the Blondes and Redhead series directed by George Stevens, who later directed Giants with Rock Cutson and Elizabeth Taylor. But his beginnings were with Hal Roach, and he moved to RKO and made a, a pre-code series. Uh, Hal Roach also comedy. I mean, the talk of Hollywood, X marks the spot, a real good, very ethnic and lingo-ish of the time um, gangster picture. But that's, that's, I can look at my pages for that information. But I just want to say that I've become the movie man because I've spent my life researching, loving, and a dedication to preserving these films, and more importantly, the knowledge and the intelligence that goes with them to let the world know of. Right, and we thank you for that. My pleasure. Yeah. It is my pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming on and talking to me again. It is my honor, Gail. Always is. I really enjoy I have a great time with you all the time. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'm going to close out this uh, recording. And um, I'm going to work on the sound. Um, I know that I'm just back after almost a year of being gone, taking care of Teddy. Uh, but uh, the sound might be a little bit off. I'm, I'm working on it. But we're back in the saddle, and we'll be putting more interviews on uh, YouTube. And uh, I hope everybody has a, a wonderful day, and God bless you and yours. God bless all of you for listening. I hope you really feel the enthusiasm that I've Hopefully some of my enthusiasm got into you so you can be movie men and movie women on your own also. Thank you. Um,
Thank you for visiting me at my lair. And God bless you and yours.